Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's conversation, um, Pushback on the Racial Wealth Gap. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I am Shalon Hawkins, and I am the CEO and publisher of Shelter Force. And before we get started, I just want to go ahead and get this chat um, function rocking and rolling. Um, so if you would please do us the favor and go ahead and put your name, your organization, um, give a quick shout out. And if there's someone that you see that you know, please, please say hello to them. Um, we like to see the chats just as active as the conversation. Um, so thank you again. If you're just joining us just now, um, thank you for joining us today at Shelter Forces webinar, Pushback on the Racial Wealth Gap. We have a very exciting panel um, for you all today. Um, there's a lot of conversation in regards to the racial wealth gap. And I know that there's a lot of opinions about uh, the racial wealth gap. Um, if you could do me the honor of putting your name, your organization and where you're hailing from, where you're representing. Um, and then also too, if you have been following the racial wealth gap webinar, um, sorry, our series under the lens, please just um, send a little reaction, a high five, a thumbs up, you know, let us know that you've been um, actively um, watching us or um, partaking in the series. Again, if you just joined us, go ahead and put your name, your organization and where you're hailing from. Um, we'd like to see our, com our um, chat just as active as our panel. Thank you for joining us. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, but please know that if you have any questions um, for our panelists, please put them in that chat function, and there will be a time towards the end of today's webinar where we, we will open it up to our guests, um, and we will be providing the questions for our panelists to answer. All right, Miriam, thank you so much, and uh, take it away. Thank you, Shalon. Uh, so my name is Miriam Axelut. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the CEO and editor in chief at Shelter Force. For I know many of you joining us are familiar with Shelter Force, but for those of you who are not, uh, we are a national publication that focuses on housing justice, affordable housing, and community development. And we just wrapped up a six-week series looking at systemic solutions to the racial wealth gap and different ways to take a look at what is going on with the racial wealth gap and what do we need to recognize in order to attempt to make progress on closing it. And so what we have with us today, we have uh, some authors and some folks whose organizations were featured in that series to give us to some more depth in that conversation. And I'm also really excited to be co-hosting this, uh, this event with NerdWallet. And uh, NerdWallet is a publication that we've spoken with over the years uh, about housing topics. And so I'm gonna let my co-host Holden Lewis introduce himself. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I've been reporting on mortgages and real estate for a consumer audience for a like, really long time. Now for NerdWallet and before that for Bankrate. My writing on this beat goes back to the opening months of the George W. Bush administration and its Ownership Society Initiative. You know, and that was a noble aim. Increase the Black home ownership rate to increase Black wealth. This Shelter Force series illustrates some of the reasons that project hasn't succeeded. We have a group of guests with thought-provoking things to say about pushing back the racial wealth gap. So, welcome. Right, so I'm gonna ask our panelists to introduce themselves when they, uh, the first time that they jump in to speak. And so we are going to jump right in. So our first question goes to Jeremy Greer. And Jeremy, one of the most common responses to the existence of the racial wealth gap 
is understandably to look for ways to help people build up wealth who don't have as much. But you've argued that there is a flip side to that that we too often ignore. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Miriam. And oh, Holden, yes, the Bush administration. I, I can I can think about that as well. Uh, my name is Jeremy Graham, uh, he, him pronouns. I'm from uh, Liberation Generation War National Movement support organization working to support uh, the creation of a new economy that centers the needs of people of color um, in our economy. So I'm happy to be here. And Mary, uh, thanks for that question. It's, um, you know, what, reflecting on it, um, it feels good, right? Like to talk about helping people build wealth, like it feels good. It's like the feel good part of the work, right? It's, it, you know, everyone puts together their report and they got the smiling face of the Latino family in front of the, the sold sign in front of the house or the black business owner in front of his food truck with a big smile on his face. Like that's the stuff that feels good. And, but like the reality is that we, that there's two sides of the of wealth, right? There's the, the, the assets you have, but also the debt and the, the things and that while resources are going into households there's also forces out there in the world stripping and pulling wealth out of households and when we're talking about the racial wealth gap we have to come to reckon with the reality that we call a liberation of generation the oppression economy that's an economy that we live in now where baked into the structures and systems of the economy are forces of systemic racism or white supremacy that are intentionally created to extract wealth from communities of color. When you think about the way communities of color are criminalized in this country, when you think about the ways that communities of color are politically disenfranchised in this country, you think about the ways in which corporate power holds such a hold over the, the, the wallets and the livelihoods of people of color. And of course, the dual financial system that people of color have to navigate. We're navigating, we have a, a, dual, a, a financial system where on one hand, there's all types, sorts of products and services mostly available to, to white folks that build wealth, right? You know, your, your, your home equity, your 401k plans, your, you know, all of that stuff over there. And then on the other side, there's a lot of stuff that is extracting wealth from people. And much of that is concentrated in marketed to people of color, for people of color and really extracting wealth out of people of color. Um, some things that I would raise that I think we should pay attention to in this area are, um, you know, there's, there's a real effort to deny access to people of color, to core resources and services. And some of the other, um, some of the other uh, panelists are gonna talk about some of those, um, that exclusion. But, you know, when you think about uh, things about the way that risk is priced, and, and letting risk be the thing. And when you know that all the metrics say that like black people are more risky, you get higher interest rates for black people. That's how you get that, that outcome. You know, student loan debt, when students are targeted to go to these for-profit institutions that aren't gonna give them any kind of, um, any kind of real education, but are gonna put them in, in debt for the rest of their lives. That's an example of that, that, that wealth stripping portion of the economy. And then stuff that's not actually in the financial services sector that we have to uh, pay attention and focus on. Things like medical debt. You know, when people of color are more reliant on healthcare because basically racism is making us sick, you're gonna run up more medical debt. Rental debt, when you see disproportionate numbers of people of color being, um, put out for eviction or being being brought to court for eviction that creates more rental debt you know back rent and i'll say you know and, and i'm going to close with this one because it's one that i think is really illustrative about how this is really intentional and really systematic um, i'm going to talk about municipal fines and fees and court fines and fees and i'm going to use an example in florida so in florida there was all this advocacy work that went to make sure that people who were formerly convicted of crime and served time in prison could vote and take part in the democratic process. Um, and the voters of Florida voted on a referendum to make that happen. State legislature said, no, 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 we're not gonna let this happen. 
So what they did was they passed a law that said, if you haven't paid all of your court fines and fees, some of them up to like 50 and $60,000 for some people, you could not participate in the democratic process. That is a very intentional act targeted a very group of people. And while yes, it was about the right to vote, I think what it illuminates is that there are things that are not that are outside of the financial sector, court fines and fees, for example, that are really stripping the wealth and access, uh, stripping the wealth and resources out of um, communities of color, which are really making it hard for them to get ahead. So what I'll say is when somebody comes to you and asks you or presents an argument that assumes that there's some choice for a, for a black or a, or a Latinx person around like whether they can purchase a home or whether they can start a business, whether that's like a choice point for them, I would say to you, there are a lot of things outside of their control that are pulling those resources that are really making that a non-choice for them and that we shouldn't be worrying about the choices that people make, but we should be focusing on the systems that are extracting and stripping wealth out of uh, communities of color. I'll stop there. I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, Nikitra, government intervention helped create, and, and Jeremy just gave us an example, not on the housing side, but there's lots of examples on the housing side, helped create the racial wealth gap by making it easier or possible for white households to build wealth. And some of those have, some of those policies are gone now. Is just removing those biased policies enough or do we need to do something more? Thank you for the question and thank you for having me today. I'm delighted to be here with my colleagues to talk about this very important topic. I'm Nikki Trebelli. I'm a senior vice president of public policy for the National Fair Housing Alliance. NAFA is the nation's only civil rights organization solely dedicated to eliminating all forms of housing and lending discrimination. We represent more than 200 local fair housing enforcement agencies all across the country. So to your question, race conscious policies favoring whites created today's homeownership and wealth disparities. And we believe only race conscious remedies can fix them. These policies entrenched homeownership disparities by giving white Americans access to federally insured mortgages. These mortgages were low cost and they denied equal opportunity for black families and other families of color to build similar opportunities in homeownership that could translate later to wealth. So these policies and practices underlying federal programs included denial of credit for qualified borrowers buying in predominantly black neighborhoods creating a depressed value of homes in those neighborhoods. And just for background purposes, in the first 35 years of the FHA insured mortgage program, only 2% of federally backed mortgages went to families of color. So white families had an initial investment of $120 billion in federal investments to really help jumpstart their ability to build home, home equity, which they've later been able to pass forward across successive generations in the form of wealth. We know that that support did not only limit itself to those homeowners, private developers also benefited from these federal investments and they use racially restrictive covenants to exclude families of color from whole communities. So when we look at places like Levittown, New York, we see that families who have been able to purchase homes in those communities are living in homes today that are valued in the uppers of 400,000 to 500,000 of dollars. Many families of color were locked out of having that same opportunity. So what we know for sure is that this discrimination actually hurts us and it costs the entire economy. And research has shown that discrimination included in housing over the last 20 years has cost the US GDP $16 trillion. And that if we actually take efforts to address the discrimination, we have a chance to grow the economy by a trillion dollars per year over the next five years. So we actually need to have the courage to put forth policies that are inclusive that will bring in the very communities that we left behind. And I'm hopeful to get to those policies as we continue our discussion. Great, I'm looking forward to getting into those tools with you as well. Um, Dan, one of the ways that wealth is extracted from particularly black homeowners is appraisal bias, which you wrote about for us in, in our recent series. Can you tell us both a little bit about that and, and particularly what you found about why the solutions to it are, are complicated? Sure. 
Hi, uh, my name is Dan Reed. Uh, I work as an urban planner and I do freelance writing on housing and transportation issues. And I was really excited to cover uh, appraisal bias for this series uh, because it's not just it is it's not just something that you know addresses the racial leads to the racial wealth gap, but is also I think indicative of the sort of systemic problems that result in it, um, and how individual decisions sort of together uh, cannot actually fix systemic problems. Right. Uh, so in the piece, basically, I looked at how um, there's frequently a difference in how much homes are appraised for, identical homes if one is in a black neighborhood or in a white neighborhood, and that there's research showing that basically the, the cost of blackness when you get an appraisal can be anywhere from a quarter to 50% uh, of a decrease in value compared to a home in a white community. And we've seen a lot of stories about this in the news. There was a big story from the Bay Area a couple of years ago about a family that had put hundreds of thousands of dollars of renovations into their home and got it appraised for what they had paid for it without that $500,000 of improvements. There was another story in the Washington Post just today about a, a Black family in a very affluent Black community here in Maryland um, that their home was appraised for $300,000 less than they paid for it six years ago. And this is an increasingly high profile phenomenon but the solutions are kind of elusive, right? Um, appraisers are generally independent contractors. They often work for themselves and they are trained through apprenticeships. So today's appraisers are often being trained by people who were trained several decades ago when there was explicit direction to use race as a factor in determining the value of a house. And it's really difficult to get in the industry because it is so insular so basically this this even though fair housing says you don't have to fair, fair housing laws and all these other things exist to prevent discrimination like it is literally baked into the way appraisers do their work um that's part of the issue there have been a lot of discussions about can we automate that process instead uh but it, there are also you know the algorithms used to automate home appraisals also have errors in them because they're designed by people and also affects the scale too, right? Even if you use an automated appraisal, if you're looking at homes in the same community, you're still reflecting and essentially recycling uh, that discrimination that leads to lower home prices. Uh, one of the most intriguing proposals in the story that I, I researched was one that basically would take homes and use an automated appraisal to compare them to every comparable house in the region. So not so homes with similar features, but in neighborhoods with similar characteristics, regardless of race. Uh, and this could be a, a, a very significant way to dramatically improve the wealth for Black homeowners by putting them on an equal playing field with white homeowners who might be 5, 10, 20 miles away in the same region in a, in a, in a comparable neighborhood. So it, uh, it was a really interesting look at a problem that is uh, I think way more common than we might give it credit for. It's one of those things sort of like, it's in the air we breathe, you know, how we perceive neighborhoods and how we perceive the value of place. All right, Joe, you're a lender. And you know, there are racial biases out there. How do you prepare prospective homeowners of color to know what they're going up against and what tools are available to help them achieve home ownership. Well, thank you, Holden, and thank you, Miriam, for pulling this together. I enjoyed our prep session, and I hope we can bring the same energy to this that we had before. My name is Joe Hansen, and I am Executive Vice President of Strategic Initiatives for the Indianapolis Neighborhood Housing Partnership. I'm different than my fellow part, uh, participants in, in a number of ways, but one of which we represent a county. So our prior three speakers are talking about kind of their systems level view. And, and I think my role on this panel is as much as anything, just kind of talk about the, the boots on the ground and what, what we're able to do and what we're attempting to do. So Holden, in response to your specific question, I, I just talk about our approach and what we've been doing for nearly 35 years in Indianapolis. And it all starts with preparation. You, the, the, the seat of your question was really in how do we prepare people of color who want to be home buyers? And, and it is that preparation. So whether it's the homeownership advising process, we're working one-on-one -on -one with someone, or it's the 
uh, specific education around the home buying process, it is about preparation. It's about making sure that the buyers understand what they're taking on. If home ownership is in fact their choice, they need to understand what a good deal is. And it's not just the value of the real estate, but the importance of an inspection and the importance of appraisal and the limits of an appraisal to Dan's comments. And then to some of Jeremy's comments, it's understanding the competitive nature of pricing. Don't get one mortgage offer, but let's look at multiple offers. Let's compare and contrast offers to make sure you're getting the best deal uh, to protect yourself from some of the risks of extraction that Jeremy was talking about. So that's really the heart of the preparation is, is just having that, that basis of education. And then some of the additional tools, as, as we've looked at the data, national data and local data, we try to unpack what's really prevented access. And that's where we come in as a lender with tools specifically designed to overcome barriers. For instance, we know that African-American borrowers are more likely to be denied due to credit uh, than their peers. So we've developed and, and are implementing programs that try to focus on other factors rather than just the credit score. Let's try to remove that barrier and identify other indicators of success. In this case, we're focused on their rent payments. So do they have a rental history that demonstrates a seriousness that would be transferable into they're going to make a mortgage payment and therefore we're setting them up for success in the future. Um, and so using different programs that overcome a barrier. And another example uh, that really gets into some of the potential siphoning, two examples, in fact, you know, one is a very low interest rate mortgage. So uh, we've been offering one and a quarter percent 20 year fixed rate mortgages. And what that does is that means very little of the payment is actually going towards interest service and most of it is going through principal reduction. In fact, that principal reduction is wealth and it's accumulating over 20 years instead of 30. And that's allowing for a much quicker accumulation of that wealth and subject to appraisal bias, then the homeowner is able to tap into that wealth and do the business formation or whatever else that household wants to do with the equity that they've accumulated more quickly in their home. You pair that with other programs around down payment assistance and individual development accounts that help people overcome barriers. Some of the most common barriers for African-American applicants is to overcome that down payment. And so happy programs that provide that down payment assistance. And Nikita, in the, in the prep session, you talked about some of that. And, and I'm, I'm hopefully you'll be able to weave in some of your down payment assistance comments uh, as we move forward. But those are important barrier busters uh, to to the broader conversation of if homeownership is the choice for you, how can it successfully be used as a wealth generation strategy? Thank you. Thanks, Joe. I'm going to pause right here and first remind everybody who's listening to pop your questions in the chat. Shalon's going to be monitoring that chat and we're going to get to your questions at the end of this session. So if you want to direct them to a particular panelist, to all the panelists, if you want to uh, send feedback and ask questions about the racial wealth gap series and shelter force, please drop those questions in. And I also want to encourage, as Joe just mentioned, encourage our panelists to jump in. This doesn't have to be me and Holden ask you a question and then the next person, like, I know that you have uh, things to say to, your, to each other and in the second half want to um, give a little more space for that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to model that by asking a follow-up right now to Joe, which is, Joe, when, and real quickly, just when you have these conversations, do you go in saying, look, this system is, is rigged right now. It's not fair. And so we're going to help you get over these barriers and things. But just to be clear, like we're starting from the fact of some of these things aren't fair. Do you, are you explicit about that when you talk to home buyers? It's a great question, and, and I'm not in those conversations. I can't be explicit in terms of whether we do or not. But one of the reactions I have to that question is, I think our African-American applicants already know that it's not fair. I, I don't think that's really something we have to tell them. So I don't mean to be cute with that response, but I, I think they come in armed with that information. Very good point. 
Miriam, if I may jump in, I think Jeremy made a really important point earlier. Our nation's fair lending laws have yet to be fully enforced. So we've had fair housing and fair lending laws on the books in this country since 1866. In 1866, Congress decided that it was against the law to um, have housing discrimination. So that law went unenforced for 102 years until we were able to pass the 68 Fair Housing Act, which provided an affirmative responsibility on the federal government to actually root out discrimination in housing. So I just want to clarify the point that there's much that we can actually do here. We need to give people equitable opportunities and we need to put people on a level playing field where they have a fair shot and have access to the game in the same way that everyone else has. Reverend Jackson has this saying that I always like to borrow. He says that when the rules are fair and the refs are fair, we win. So the, the reality is for Black, Latino, and other consumers of color, we've never been in a fair system. So, so this idea that homeownership might not work for us is rooted in a system of oppression. If we're allowed to participate in the system fairly, we know that we succeed. And I'll, I'll just point to Dan Emmergluck's research, which looked at home ownership after the Great Recession. We had worked really hard to put in place the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, which eliminated many of the issues that we had leading into the Great Recession of 2008, where Black and Latino consumers were disproportionately steered into dangerous and risky toxic loans, even though they qualified for loans in safer and more affordable terms. His research shows that in a five-year period, Black families that were able to get mortgages were able to get loans that were safe and they were able to accumulate about $45,000 in home equity. So it shows that when we're given an opportunity to participate fairly in the system, we actually perform well. Thanks, Sikita. Let me jump in and uh, ask Jeremy a question. Jeremy, you know, you talked about how there's just so many different ways that wealth extraction works. Where do you start? I mean, if you had one action to take, like the first step to fight back against wealth extraction, what would that be? Where would you start? Yeah, you know, I get that, I get that question a lot. Like, what's the silver bullet? And I got bad news. I don't have one, right? There's like, we, we have to scour every element and every aspect of these systems because the, the oppression that we're talking about is baked in to many, many systems. I want to I want to double click on something that uh, Nikita talked about, which is this idea of making sure that we're race conscious in whatever we do across the board. And the reason why we have to do is because it was a race conscious approach that got us here. It was just another direction. <laughs> it was in the direction of discrimination. It was in the direction of racism. And it was a very race conscious approach to, to block people from opportunity, to extract resources from them, all of the things that have been talked about. So whether it's reforming our credit reporting system, for example, that is, a, that is something that's gonna come up a lot uh, in this conversation as, as a barrier to people of color getting access to credit. We have to do that with a race conscious approach, recognizing that the system as it lives today is one that uses credit reporting as a proxy to identify who is black and who is not or who is Latino and who is not when applying for a mortgage. Like, let's be straight, that's what it does, right? Whether it's that, whether it's the appraisal process that, um, that Dan is talking about, is a very race conscious, you talked about a race conscious effort that got us to the point that it is used as a way to devalue black homeowners so that they can take advantage of them. So we need a race conscious approach to flip that back on the other end. So, what, so again, I don't have a silver bullet. I think there's there's places we should look at across the board in every aspect of our housing system. But I want to double click on what Nikita said that we have to approach it with a race uh, conscious approach in the direction of justice, not in the direction of um, you know racism and discrimination. Nikita, you said you know we have tools. Um, we just need the political courage to wield them, what are some of those tools? So, so starting with our nation's fair lending laws, like I just discussed, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act already allows for the use of special purpose credit programs. And special purpose credit programs are a tool that lenders could use 
to think about the people that they are underserving and then to design a product to reach those underserved consumers who might be excluded by their other requirements for determining credit worthiness. And, and I love when we have a conversation about credit scoring because it's important to talk about the history of discrimination that's baked into credit scores. We know that families of color were not in a position to enter into home ownership at the same rate that whites were in the initial years of these federal policies. So whites have more wealth, you know, they have eight times the wealth of Black Americans and five times the wealth of Latino Americans, for an example. So when we look at things like credit scoring, we see that history of wealth baked into those scoring. Families who have not had the opportunity to pass forward to successive generations down payment assistance that they were able to build up in the form of home equity are going to need to purchase a home and will have a lower down payment and their credit score will be lower as a reflection of needing to utilize a higher a level of their loan amount. So that's gonna be reflected in their credit score. So we need less discriminatory alternatives to credit scoring. So we can look at something like rental payment history, which is very much so analogous to a home mortgage payment history. And that's one way that we can think about less discriminatory alternatives. It's not the only one, but it's one that we should we should take into consideration. And we shouldn't do that um, without realizing that renters also face discrimination. So we have to you know, attack these issues on multiple prongs. And I think that's the most important point. We're not going to have one single solution to closing the racial wealth gap. We're going to need an all out attack. Like we are literally at war, but we have to, we have to put it in the context that not addressing the racial wealth gap through home ownership gives us an opportunity to leave behind the communities that we left behind, but it also will hurt the overall economy. So some other things that we need to consider are right before us. The Build Back Better Act's uh, housing provisions contain $10 billion for first generation home buyers. These are home buyers whose families were excluded by prior federal policies. By giving these home buyers access to this down payment assistance, we overcome one of the, the very um, important barriers that families of color face in attempting to enter into home ownership. If we invest $10 billion in targeted first generation down payment assistance based on a proposal that my organization developed along with a partner organization, we could actually grow home ownership by 5 million home buyers across the country. 1.7 million of those home buyers would be black, 1.32 million would be Latino, and 1.4 million of them would be white. We know that by doing that, we would, you know, ignite the economy because creating home ownership also creates jobs. So we would generate an opportunity to create thousands of jobs and billions of dollars in local revenues. So, so these type of inclusive policies are the things that we have to have the courage to do. The, the House of Representatives already passed the Build Back Better Act. Everyone here should call their member in the Senate and tell them to pass the Build Back Better Act. We're experiencing a recovery that's not inclusive, that's not equal. So we have a tool that we could actually use um, and we just need to help our policymakers understand that now is the time to act. Nikitra, can I ask a follow-up question? I appreciate your reference to the uh, Special Purpose Credit Program. In, in your seat, have you seen that done well anywhere? Do you have any examples to hold up? I really do. So we know that a major lender is using a place-based special purpose credit program. I can't say their name, you know, um, their major lender. I don't want to sound like I'm endorsing, but they have a program. We also know that in San Diego, List has a program where there is targeted first uh, time home buyer assistance for African-American consumers. So I'll drop that link in the chat so that everyone can look at that. So we know that it's a tool that, that we can use. It's already legal. The Department of Housing and Urban Development came out with a statement saying that if lenders adopt the special purpose credit program under um, and in compliance with the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, that it also comports with the promises of the Fair Housing Act. So we've heard from, you know, CFPB, which is responsible for ECOA, and the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is responsible for the Federal Fair Housing Act, and then all the other regulatory agencies have chimed in. So we had this too, and now is the time for us to use it. Great. So 
Dan, speaking of, of tools that we have, and you, you started to talk a little bit about, you know, how, how one might change the way that we appraise properties, which has been absolutely um, discriminatory. But you've also noted that changing the values of undervalued neighborhoods all at once, say if we move to that regional um, approach, could potentially have the problem of contributing to gentrification and even housing affordability problems, which is particularly of concern when we're talking about racial equity, because currently people of color are disproportionately renters and could be affected by a change in, in housing values that made things less affordable. Um, so talk about that, you know, that home buyer, homeowner tension in fixing the appraisal gap. Oop, you're I think in a lot of housing conversations we have right now, there is this tension between home potential home buyers and homeowners, right? Uh, we have a, a massive re, a national housing shortage right now. We're short three or four million homes that haven't been built in the past 10 or 15 years due to the recession. And so you have home buyers competing to, to purchase homes and particularly in high desirable areas. And their interest is for homes to be less expensive so they can have access to them, right? And they can get on the economic ladder themselves. But for the, the homeowner, the fact that there's a housing shortage and the fact that there's 20 people in a bidding war on their home are fantastic, right? They want, they would like to get a bigger return on their investment. And they are, and oftentimes we see homeowners fight any attempts to change that or to anything that might impact their property values because they're trying to maximize their investment. And these two things are always in tension with each other. The appraisal gap, the uh, appraisal bias is no different, right? Um, there are incumbent homeowners benefit from the difference in home values versus in white neighborhoods versus black neighborhoods if you're in a white neighborhood. Uh, that is a cohort that probably won't be very happy with an approach that values all homes the same because their home is suddenly, if not, um, it's not, you know, even if it's equally valuable, that's still in the eyes of some a loss, right? For potential home buyers, you know, uh, home buyers of all races are seeking out affordable areas in a given region because homes are more affordable there. And that, as you described, can lead to, to processes like gentrification, but like their interest is to find affordable homes where they are. And if all homes are suddenly appraised at a regional level now, those areas are now taken out of reach. So uh, one of the solutions that uh, Dr. Andre Perry, who's done a lot of research on this recommended in, in the story that I wrote was, this is the time to give people like actually just direct like cash and financial support to buy homes. This is down payment assistance. These are home buyer grants. These are special loan uh, products uh, like Joe was talking about that just sort of lower the barriers to uh, buying a home or sort of reduce, reduce the burden of a large mortgage, right? But even were that to happen, the tension still remains, right? Like across the entire region of all the home buyers have increased, um, there's still somebody who's gonna be left out of that. And, you know, the broader, economic disparities that we see also have to be addressed, right? Like I, I know it sounds a little defeatist to say like, we have to fix capitalism first, but as long as home prices are outpacing incomes, you know, appraisal bias and addressing appraisal bias is still only sort of tinkering around the edges of the broader issues that we have. All right, so I have a question that's called from the chat and um, I'll direct this to Nikitra, but I know Jeremy's gonna wanna jump in and probably the rest of you too. And that is, um, you know, a lot of the solutions we hear people talk about are um, individual solutions. You know, I mean, when people talk about let's let's fix the, the racial wealth gap, they start talking about like um, black and brown people just maybe don't know as much about personal finance, right? So what do we do to address those systemic practices and, and you know, inform kind of the dominant uh, culture that, that we have these, these practices that extract wealth from even savvy home buyers and investors? So, so let me be clear, I don't think that consumer education is the solution to systemic um, challenges in the marketplace. I think that we need to make sure we have proper laws um, fully enforced to deal with systemic challenges. And we actually have a robust fair lending 
infrastructure, fair housing and fair lending infrastructure to do so. Um, the Fair Housing Act and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act provides many protections that we, we simply need to better use. And they also provide solutions in a way that you can create and design programs. And I'm gonna go to the appraisal issue um, specifically. So just this morning, the um, White House and Secretary Fudge and Ambassador Rice, uh, along with Vice President Harris, announced in very critical report um, and an action plan. It's not actually a report, it's an action plan on ways that we um, can address, on ways that we can address systemic devaluations of homes in black communities and other communities of color. So we need multilateral approaches. We need tweaks to existing laws for um, appraisal bias issues to be address, we need to make sure that the um, appraisal industry itself is more diverse. Um, we, we know that there are barriers to entry in that system. And oftentimes there are requirements for you know, a college education. There is an apprenticeship um, requirement. All of these barriers to entry make it more difficult for that industry to diversify. It's time for that industry um, to diversify itself. We know that more than 90% of appraisers are white males. There is a challenge when there isn't lived history um, being utilized in doing these evaluations and, and simply moving to automatic um, valuation methods won't simply solve the problem because the reality is, is that in communities of color, many families live in older homes, homes that you kind of can't just send, uh, you know, housing floor plans for. We can do that in suburban communities with newer properties, but it's more difficult to do that and, and, and neighborhoods of color. So we need to make sure within that industry, everyone is receiving fair housing training. That's not something that is being required. So if, if we utilize our nation's fair housing and fair lending laws in a more effective way, we can solve many of, of these issues. But, but I, I think it's critical that the burden can't be on you know, the individual to protect themselves from discrimination. Systemic discrimination has to be rooted out by policymakers and also the marketplace. And the marketplace should appreciate that discrimination is a drag on the economy. And if the marketplace wants to see itself excel, especially when we know that seven out of 10 future home buyers are going to be families of color. So if we're gonna have a safe and sound mortgage market, we need families of color able to get safe and affordable loans because the reality is older homeowners who need to sell their homes won't have a pool of potential home buyers to sell their properties to, which will impact their ability to have a safe retirement. So it's a, you know, all of us based solution um, to, to, to really allow for inclusive policies to drive the kind of future economic growth that, that we all need. Yeah, no, you're, you were right, Holden. I do want to comment on this and I want to point to that, um, Nefertiti uh, has a comment on this in the chat that people should take a look at. Um, this chat is fire, by the way. I really enjoyed watching the chat as we all talk. But I wanted so I, this this conversation about financial education and like knowledge or lack of knowledge or like people making poor choices. It is all a veil. It is all a curtain to be held up to hide hide some things. And I'm going to identify two things that. I think it's hiding. One, the racism is profitable, right? The existence of racism in this country is something that people can exploit to make profit. And when I say it, I'm not just talking about like the predatory lender in the strip mall. I'm also talking about the major multinational bank that is that is running and operating this economy with its cohorts and its friends. And that is something that is a real truth that that well, because if you're telling people that it's about they don't know enough or they're not smart enough, it distracts us from the fact that it is the color of their skin that is creating the barriers that are before them. The other truth that it that it, that it distracts us from really talking about and really reckoning with is, yes, black skin is devalued, brown skin is devalued, but white skin is valued and put on a premium. There is a real value to whiteness. And through public policy, when we're talking about creating equitable practices, what you are doing is to lower the valuation of whiteness. And that is something that, in, that we have to be real about if we're moving in that direction. This appraisal thing is not just about devaluing black homes, it is also about scaling the value of white homes. Mm -hmm. So we have to get real about these things if we're going to do it. And these conversations about people's choice and people's knowledge and people's ability is to distract us from having that real conversation. 
Go no, for it. Absolutely. Oh, okay. go ahead. I'll go after you. <laughs> well, no, I was, you know, I was really struck by this this story in the Washington Post today. Let me find it so I can put it in the chat box. But uh, you know, they interviewed these this, this black family in in a very rich black suburb of Washington D.C. Where you know this family owns a company. They bought a one and a half million dollar house. These are you know wealthy, educated people who put a wine cellar and a spiral staircase in their house, and you know to an appraiser, all of that goes out the window because this family was black, right? And that just goes to show that even if you you know the way that uh, it's constructed, even if you try to take on these these uh, emblems of status, you know the color of your skin still overrides that. And I think that is one of the things that underpins all of this, right? Like we create these signifiers of status, the types of homes you have, or especially uh, school districts, you know, the quality of schools are a big thing. Um, but so much of that is intertwined with, with whiteness, right? Um, I talk about schools a lot because the value, you know, you, you're buying into a certain school district when you, you purchase, a, purchase a home and, you know, appraisers basically recycle that every time they do an appraisal on a house is basically showing you know, what's the value of being in access to this, this community. And you know, studies show that like middle-class families, families with means do well regardless of the school that they're in, but we assign value to the schools where most of the kids are white. And that is in many ways parallel to what we see with appraisal bias. Like what, what is in the house is often irrelevant uh, in the eyes of valuation it's about who's living in the house and who's living around the house. And that, that has to change. And I think it is, it is often so baked into our, our perceptions and our culture of a place. You know, every, every kid growing up in a city or in a region learns the geography of like, what are the desirable neighborhoods, what are the not desirable neighborhoods, what are the desirable schools and the undesirable schools and how they fit into it. And, you know, I can't necessarily blame the individual appraiser for absorbing that too and, and recycling it. Uh, but the question is, how do we, you know, if we can, you know, do we address this culture first or do we address uh, sort of the laws around it first? And if we address the laws first, is that going to trickle down to changing the culture of place that undergirds all this valuation? I want to just echo that, Dan, because it, you know, when Nikita mentioned markets mm -hmm. and yes, if markets were rational, people would recognize that there is a cost to to continuing to let them be uh, racist, and you guys have identified that cost. But uh, this culture that Dan is talking about is still very present, and that premium of whiteness that that Jeremy mentioned means that by this sort of supply and demand, there's still more demand for neighborhoods that are primarily white. And even if we fix the appraisal numbers, it might not fix mm -hmm. what people are willing to pay in those different areas. And I think that's that's something that's very hard to get at in, in policy. And there's a lot of policy that we can change and we should change. That's still going on there. And I wonder how we how we approach that. So I think when we're talking about the value of whiteness, it's important to remind everyone that not all Americans have always been white. So all white Americans now who are identifying as white are, are able to do so because of federal housing policies. And that's why I'm such a champion for policy change because because the reality is, is when neighborhoods were graded based on uh, color code and those maps were actually created to red line communities, there were gradations um, for those color codes. So, you know, green were a certain type of white, yellow were a different kind of white, and then naturally red was mostly black, um, including black families who were able to afford a mortgage. So, so that's something critical for us to talk about. So we have to look at how those New Deal policies really cemented this idea of what whiteness is and expanded it to more Americans while denying that opportunity to, to Black families and other families of color. I dropped in the chat just a, 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 a description that HUD, um, not HUD, that the, the Fair Housing Administration utilized, it adopted that kind of gradation from the homeowners loan corporation and the way that communities were color coded and graded. So, it, so it's important to understand that white isn't even a permanent construct. It's very fluid and it's been used to include Jewish people and Polish people and Italians and Catholics 
who were not always considered white. So, so we have to be very, very careful when we talk about changing attitudes and hearts and, and separating that from public policy, because it is very much so public policy that has cemented what the idea about what whiteness is. And I think we, we have work to do to help our neighbors appreciate that, that the way that we have the system set up is such that in those public schools, as um, Dan has mentioned, we see that education is being funded in a disparate way as well. So schools that have predominantly um, white students in their school districts, they are spending about $332 more, um, about $23 billion more on a student. So we are making intentional public policy investments beyond housing in, in these disparities. And that's why we have to address them through housing because housing is so central and critical to all of them. And if we had a whole nother panel, we could talk about how, you know, where you live matters so much that the very air that you breathe, right? So, so, so Black people living in formerly redlined neighborhoods and Latinos living in formerly redlined neighborhoods breathe more toxic air. So, so housing is the driver. And I, and I really believe firmly that public policies that center inclusive housing growth are, are the way that we go forward. All right, I wanna stick with you, <laughs> Nikki, Trevig. There's a lot of interest uh, in the chat about special purpose credit programs. One question, uh, two questions. The first one is, um, okay, those are supported by the current administration. W is there concern that that support could change in other administrations and then like open lenders who created the programs to risk of discrimination claims and, and what can you do to mitigate that? And then the second question is, is there a way to use um, special purpose credit programs to target black small businesses, um, farm loans and that kind of thing? So no matter what we do, we're gonna face challenges, right? Like the point is to design programs in a way that they can withstand judicial scrutiny. And that's why I dropped the link in earlier to the NAPA blog that we did and the, the legal paper that we produced on how you actually properly design a special purpose credit program. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act is very specific about how those programs need um, to be designed. And I'm gonna actually walk through just really quickly, we won't um, have enough time today, but I walk through two requirements. First, the program has to be established and administered pursuant to a written plan that identifies the class of persons that the program is designed to benefit and it must set forth the procedures and standards for extending credit pursuant to the program. And then the second one is that the program is established and administered um, to extend credit to a class of persons who under the organization's customary standards of credit worthiness probably would not receive such credit over receive it on less favorable terms um, than, than other applicants. So, so the, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act is very prescriptive in how the programs have to be designed and designing those programs with council can allow it to withstand any type of judicial scrutiny. But the reality is any inclusive policy in this climate in our country is going to come under attack. We just have to build enough political will that we push back against those attacks. The, the data shows us that inclusive growth is in the benefit of all of us. I, I'm saying that um, simply because it's in the benefit of all of us. I think we should do these things because they're the right thing to do. Don't, don't get me wrong. But sometimes in order to convince people to come along with you, you have to help them undersee, understand how it benefits them. So I'm, I'm sharing that it, it has broader and global um, benefits um, for consumers. And then absolutely, you can create a special purpose credit program beyond traditional housing um, uh, and, and, and lending um, policies, it could be designed for small businesses and other forms of lending. Um, it's, it's, it's authorized under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which applies to lending transactions. Can I add on that? And I just want to say before I add on that, I'm not at all disagreeing with what Nikita said about the practicality of where we are now, right, and the, what the laws allow us to do. But what I want to add to that is, in order for us to get out of this mess, we need to, one, move forward in a way that is that is creating more inclusivity and two taking a retrospective and undoing the harms of the past and that means really reckoning that like certain groups have been disproportionately harmed by our housing system 
and our land use system across the country, all these systems, and that there should be an effort to target repair that maybe our current laws won't allow to those folks. And that that is the way that we have, that is the thing that we have to think about moving forward. So where if, you know, law doesn't allow us to just provide non, you know, first time home buyer assistance to black people, that that is something that we have to, that we should advocate for in law, changes to law so that we can do, because the reality is if we keep using these like proxies, like income, we're going to miss black people who have been harmed by that. We're going to miss indigenous people who have been harmed by land use policy in this country. So I, I just want to say that like, and again, this isn't to disagree with that very pragmatic approach that Nikita just laid out about using existing law, but we can't end our advocacy with like the tools that we have today because they aren't adequate enough to really get us out of where we are into a future. <clears throat> Great. I want, we're coming very close to the end. I wanted to give um, Joe a chance to talk to us a little bit more, speaking of, because people are really interested in particular topics, uh, specific tools rather, to talk a little bit more about the rent focused underwriting and particularly the, the surprise um, that you had when you first got the applicants in. Sure. Um, Again, this has been such an interesting conversation, and we're really looking at it from two different ways. Most of this conversation has been about the systemic issues that have led to it and the systemic solutions that are going to be needed to solve it at scale. But in the meantime, we still have families pursuing home ownership. And so my part of this conversation is really about how are we coming alongside them and, and helping with that. And so the rent focus was one of those responses. And I, I described that before, but it's really replacing viewing the credit score as the primary vehicle and looking at their ability to sustain rent. And Nikita, I think it was you that made the comment. It's, it's going to be important to understand there's also some racial bias in rental contracts that could result in disruptions in rental payment. And that could further cause someone to not be able to qualify for this program. And we'll have to be sensitive to that. That's, that's good additional learning. But one of the things we learned when we rolled out this program was we gave applicants a chance to think that there might be a different program, a program that was not previously available to them. And, and now they have a chance to consider an alternative approach to pursuing their goals of home ownership. And what we found was that about 10% of the people that approached us and asked us uh, to participate in the rent focus, they already qualified for a traditional market product. And we were able to connect to them and move them on their way. They didn't even need this special product. And that surprised us, but it really spoke to we often encounter real and perceived barriers. Oftentimes, too often, people feel like they are cut out of a system that they really do have access to. And so we gave them um, an excuse, a reason, an opportunity to engage and ask the question. And fortunately, we were there to answer that and, and move them along. The rest of the families uh, are engaged in various levels of, of let's sort it out. Let's try to understand your rental history. And that's a, the second lesson we learned is that everyone's rental history is a little bit different. There were a lot of cash payments. There were payments of, of cash to a roommate and then the roommate was on the lease. And how do you unpack each one of those very unique rental situations? And that is simply not, based on our experience to date, that is not a scalable model as we're currently experiencing it. And so how we overcome that as a system uh, is just yet to be understood and, and yet to be learned. And we're hopeful that others will learn from what we're doing and we'll continue as a system to develop uh, tools that can meet the consumers where they are. Thanks, Joe. I think I'd like to go around because we're approaching the hour and give each one of the panelists just an opportunity to give any you know, lightning round, 30 seconds of, of final things, anything that you'd like uh, our audience to come away with today. <laughs> I'll say I am, I am in the middle of refinancing my house. Uh, so uh, the appraisal bias has become very relevant to me. I, I looked for a lender that didn't require an in-person appraisal and I found one and then they said they actually had to do one. So. Uh, next week, I'm going out of town. I'm taking my dog with me. I'm taking any pictures of me out of the house. And I look forward to getting an appraisal for what my neighbor's house is worth, if not more. 
I'd like to encourage everyone to pick up the phone and call their Senate offices. Um, let them know it's time to pass the Build Back Better Act. It's $150 billion in a wonderful housing um, package that has been really negotiated that has broad support. Um, you know, polling show that Americans across the political spectrum want to see a substantial investment in housing. And if we invest in housing as a fundamental right, we have a chance to really grow um, the economy for everyone. So thank you. Do you have anything? Yeah, what I'd say is what I wanna advocate for housing um, advocates to, which I include myself as one of them, uh, to think about the totality of everything that is stripping wealth out of households and think about the fights that are happening from an advocacy standpoint in those areas and that they are housing issues. So for example, the criminalization of people of color in a way that extracts people's wealth through court fines and fees, the medical debt that people are carrying because of, of healthcare, our, our awful healthcare system in this country, just thinking of all of those things and understanding that because they're extracting wealth, those are housing issues because those are resources that could be going towards housing people. Right, so I think it's important that housing advocates broaden our perspective to understand the totality of what people are facing when they're navigating the economy. I'll, I'll make one final comment about just engagement. Your, everyone's participation in this panel and on this call represents engagement. They're in, interested and engaged in the conversation. And whether it's as narrow geographically as the Indianapolis Neighborhood Housing Partnership, or topically like Dan's comments about appraisal bias or systemic change as represented by Nikitra. It's find your point of entry, your point of engagement and uh, continue, continue the conversation. You wanna say anything to wrap up, Holden? Well, I, uh, let's take a little bit of extra time. Let me ask a, one extra question, um, and I, maybe Joe can start with this one. Um, you know, we have, there's a lot of unbanked people out there, underbanked people. And, you know, a lot of landlords, they want automatic withdrawals for rent payments. And, you know, I'm just guessing that there's kind of a differential between um, renters of color and white renters. And, the number of people who are willing and, and able to pay their rent that way. Um, I mean, do you, do you see that as an issue? Is there any solution to it? Uh, so to the unbanked, underbanked, I, I probably don't have the, the necessary information to respond to that, but I will contradict, Holden, your comment that many landlords want automatic payments. We were surprised by how many landlords are requesting cash payments. And so as we're trying to verify rents, we're having, to, we're actually relying on checking account statements to see regular cash withdrawals or paychecks being received and $200 less being deposited. And, and really inferring and trusting, I, I think that's probably a, a stretch, that that $200 was the rent payment. And so for us, it's more of a cash economy than we anticipated going into this program. So, so I think with the type of landlord, sorry, Nikisha, go ahead. No, I just, I was just gonna say, I think that it speaks to the challenge of banking in communities of color, right? We see that bank branches are closing um, at disproportionately higher rates in neighborhoods of color um, and, and upper income, more affluent neighborhoods of color than they are in um, white neighborhoods that are less affluent. So I think it's important that um, we, you know, work on the Community Reinvestment Act and make sure we bring a race conscious focus to um, any reform of the Community Reinvestment Act. I want to talk just one thing, Miriam, you just said it, it speaks to the landlord. It's not always a landlord issue because sometimes we have uh, multiple generations living together. And so it's the, the daughter or the granddaughter that wants to buy a house and they're paying rent to mom or grandma and that's a cash payment. So 
it can be a wide variety of situations, but that's what we're running into, a cash economy. Oh, uh, quick, is the thing that I want to be conscious of and careful of are the extent to which that would affect people having overdraft fees, minimum payment fees within their bank accounts when the timing of the rent payment doesn't maybe match up with the um, income coming in. So, so, Which takes us right back to credit scoring, right? Because one of the things that we know is that traditional credit scoring doesn't often report rental payment history. So, you know, that's why we need um, less discriminatory alternatives. Yes, absolutely. And I think there's been data that shows that actually just including rent and utility payments in, would shrink the credit score, the racial difference in credit scores dramatically. Um, so I want to thank all of you for your participation. I want to let everybody uh, listening know that we have an article coming up on special purpose credit programs and race conscious policy in CRA. These are topics that we are going to continue to cover and that we're going to listen to all the things that happened in the chat today and make sure that uh, we keep exploring these really important topics at Shelter Force and always interested to hear more from, from all of you. And just thank you, thank NerdWallet and Holden for participating with us in this event, all our participants and all of the audience. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Everyone. Thank you.